Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Christy Epstein. I'm a nurse practitioner in the MS division. Many of you already know me. I would like to welcome you to this evening's MS Education Series webinar. If you're here, you're either living with MS yourself or you care about someone who's living with MS. Whatever your reason for joining us today, we're so glad to spend the next 90 minutes with you. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. You're going to remain muted uh, and your cameras will be turned off for the duration of the webinar. This session will be closed captioned and recorded for viewing at a later time. Throughout the evening, we invite you to type questions you have about the presentations into the Q&A box. Just a reminder, keep those, not, keep those private and uh, don't disclose any private information or health details general questions, and not your personal health information. All questions will be generally related to MS and the presentation content. At the end of our session, our experts will answer as many questions as possible during our Q&A panel. I'm going to serve as the moderator and presenter for this evening's conversation. I'm a nurse practitioner specializing in multiple sclerosis, and many of you already know me. I'm involved in the MS Quality of Life Clinic, and my special interests in the MS Clinic include wellness, reproductive issues, and clinical research. I'm really happy to be sharing this evening with some of my favorite colleagues from the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center MS Care Team. And I did hear that we may be graced by the presence of our fabulous chairman, Dr. Segal, so stay tuned. You're gonna learn more about all of our participants over the next hour and a half as we talk about various aspects of life with MS, including urinary dysfunction, pelvic floor therapy, and some very exciting research updates. Our team is a collaboration of physicians, scientists, nurse practitioners, and specialists that are committed to providing you with the care and treatment that is unique for you and your needs. Our goal is your comprehensive health care, and we will work as a team to help you live your very best quality of life. So next, it's going to be my absolute pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Crescens. Dr. Crescens is a urologist specializing in neurogenic bladder, as well as reconstructive urology and urogynecology. She completed her residency at the Cleveland Clinic and fellowship at University of Michigan. Her research is focused on management of newly diagnosed neurogenic bladder problems, both in a clinical setting and also in the lab. She is most interested in optimizing the use of the electronic medical record or EMR to help patients take charge of their bladder problems in order to prevent infections and hospitalizations related to issues. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Crescens. Dr. Crescens. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, um, it's really great to be here today. And uh, I am going to just go ahead and share my slides and uh, hopefully you enjoy the talks. Uh, <clears throat> so today I'll be talking about bladder troubles in MS. Uh, as many of you know, it is a big driver of quality of life for many of you. Um, my disclosures in terms of scientific uh, disclosures is that I'm an investigator for Medtronic who makes one of the sacral neuromodulation devices. So I'll start a little bit by talking about the bladder function. So bladder itself uh, is made up of um, kind of two major components. One is that it has a sac that holds the urine, which is a bladder muscle. And then there is a trigone. It's kind of the control center of everything where a lot of the nerve endings end and it's right at the bottom of the bladder. And then there's the urethra where the urine has to pass through. The urethra is surrounded by a sphincter. The sphincter is really what controls the urine coming in and out. So when you have MS uh, or uh, a stroke or Parkinson's or a spinal cord injury, uh, the bladder doesn't get the signals that it needs from the nervous system and it doesn't coordinate the function of storing urine and emptying urine as it should. Uh, as you know, in MS, that can mean um, that um, the, you may pee frequently, you may lose control of your urine, or may you, you may not pee at all. And that's called a neurogenic bladder problem. 
It comes in many, many different varieties and sizes. You may have one problem, you may have two, you may have a conglomerate of issues. And really my job here is to help you through the figuring out which problem is um, the main issue and how we can address it. Uh, in a mess, there is about um, three to 10% of patients who will have bladder problems early on in disease. And about 75 to 85% of patients overall with MS will eventually suffer a bladder problem. The severity of symptoms is correlated with the severity of the uh, MS. Uh, and the lesion location really determines the type of bladder problem you will have. <clears throat> Again, you, can, you may say that I can't pee at all, or you may pee too much. Either way, this has a significant impact on quality of life for many patients. Now, um, in uh, US, about one third of the population uh, as we get older will suffer from a bladder problem regardless of other uh, diseases. But things like age, obesity, postmenopausal status, bowel, uh, bowel dysfunction, pregnancy, vaginal deliveries, and the number of children. And in men, it's the prostate and the history of a prostate cancer that may require a surgery will all contribute uh, to the bladder problems in addition to the MS itself. And uh, there also, of course, could be diabetes and stroke and other issues uh, that can compound. So screening for urinary symptoms are done uh, usually with Christy. Christy does a wonderful job doing this at her clinics. Uh, if you uh, see her, you, you, you will know this. It's often done at the time of the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. It should be done anytime you have a flare and after the flare. And it should potentially include something called a bladder uh, ultrasound that, to measure leftover urine in a bladder. And if that number is greater than 150, generally we start thinking and talking about there being a bladder problem. Uh, <clears throat> when is it time to see a urologist? So you should um, consider seeing a urologist if you're having a lot of recurrent infections. You're not able to empty your bladder or that post-void residual, that bladder ultrasound is showing some high numbers. You have worsening symptoms. You're leaking and leaking a lot more. And honestly, it doesn't ultimately matter how bad the symptoms are, but if it is driving uh, you crazy or it's bothering you a lot, please come see us because there's things we can do to help. So what are my goals? For, uh, for my patients. Number one is I want to protect your kidneys and minimize infections. Unfortunately, with the bladder dysfunction, the leakage or difficulty emptying the bladder, that puts you at risk for several different complications and specifically the infections that could lead to some kidney damage. My other goal is to listen to you and really understand what quality of life you have and how we can make that better for you from a urinary standpoint. Um, so I wanted to do a little patient scenario to help kind of um, bring closer to home. So meet Leslie. Leslie comes into my office and says she has frequency urgency. She has turnkey incontinence. The moment she puts the key in the door, she has to pee. And she's up all night going to the bathroom. She uses four pads per day. She has significant bother with this. She's missing meetings. She's missing work. She's having accidents at work and is having to leave. Um, she drinks about two coffees in the morning and eight bottles of water. She she drinks one decaf in the uh, afternoon. And on her exam, things are pretty normal. When you come to see a urologist, you may fill out some questionnaires. What we'll do an exam. We'll check how much is left over in your bladder using a small ultrasound probe called a bladder scanner. We'll check your urine for infection, uh, sometimes, uh, especially with diminished sensation, such as you can have an MS, you may not know you have an infection. In fact, that's driving a lot of the symptoms. And we may do some safety checks, which would include a kidney ultrasound and some blood work to check the levels of the creatinine, which indicates how kidney works. For some patients, an evaluation with urology may require what we call advanced bladder testing. Some of you may be familiar with it. One advanced bladder test that we can do is called urodynamics. And this is the picture on the left. This study involves us filling your bladder with a tiny little catheter and measuring the pressures and the activity of the bladder muscle itself. That's a really nice way for me to be able to tell, is your bladder safe? 
what does your bladder think? Is it just spas uh, spastic and is it just spasming and that's why you're leaking urine? Or is there some issue where the muscle and the bladder are not talking to each other because of the neurologic problem that you have? And we need to work on that. Another test we may do is called a cystoscopy. That's uh, more infrequent for patients with neurogenic bladder problems, but uh, that may be done for you if you're having a lot of infections or if you have some blood in the urine. And that's the picture on the right. And that's where we put a small camera scope into the bladder to see the lining of the bladder. So let's talk about treatments for Leslie. And really any patient that walks into my office is we're going to start with behavioral modifications. Uh, oftentimes making some changes about how you pee and when you pee can be significant to really give you improvement uh, that you may be looking for. Um, so uh, that may include things like managing your fluids. Certainly if you come in and you say you're drinking a couple pots of coffee a day and you say, you know what, I used to do it when I was 21 and it wasn't a problem. Well, now it is. <laughs> and it is for many people. And it certainly is if you have a neurogenic bladder that's being impacted by a mess. So we, we may need to manage your fluids. We need to set realistic expectations. And really drinking 60 to 80 ounces of water a day is what we're going to be talking about. You may want to schedule your urination. I sometimes have uh, patients who, who just wait and wait and wait and wait. And then when they have to go, they don't have much time to make it. And so sometimes just something as simple as setting an alarm to go to the bathroom every two to three hours will prevent the majority of leaks. Um, and, and that could be a really easy, nice way to manage your bladder. Uh, constipation. So I always uh, say this, but there's only so much space in your pelvis. There's bones and the bladder and the bowel is right in there, nicely, tightly packed. So if you haven't pooped in a week, chances are there's nowhere for your bladder and the urine to go. So you probably will have to go pee very frequently and you may lose control because of the constipation, really putting a lot of pressure on that bladder. So managing constipation is a big deal. And it's also a big deal in MS because just like the bladder can be affected by nerve changes and nerve injuries, the bowel will be affected by nerve damage as well. The neck maneuver, it's a really nice um, kind of treatment uh, option that uh, will be part of your physical therapy uh, or physical therapy itself is a really, really great option. And we'll have more about that later. But Essentially, these two things are, are learning how to use your pelvic floor muscles in order to manage your bladder effectively. So if you feel an urge coming up, you may want to use your Kegel muscles to prevent it from becoming an issue. You may want to stop what you're doing, squeeze the Kegel muscles, and that sometimes is enough to prevent a leak. Now you have to know how to use your Kegel muscles. And that's why the physical therapy is so important and working with a physical therapist, especially using something called a biofeedback system where you learn how to actually use those muscles, making sure that you're using the right muscles to really control your urine um, and control the leaks as much as possible. All right. Um, and you know, while you're working on that, we may want to use an incontinence device. They range um, from um, pads to diapers to the pens to some options for men, which are penile clamps and, and little condom catheters, which can be quite nice. And there's this new device called the PureWick female external catheter, which is kind of like a little suction tampon that will suction the urine out, but you are connected to it too. Uh, if... Uh, that doesn't get you where you want to be. The next step is medications, um, generally for what we call overactive bladder or leakage that happens most commonly with MS. There's a variety of different medications. They have different side effect profiles, uh, but they're supposed to help you with the overactive bladder, making it to the bathroom on time, having time to find the bathroom and not leaking on your way there and not going as often. <laughs> If medications are not effective, we generally would have a discussion about what we call third-line treatments. The primary, the FDA-approved third-line treatment for uh, patients with multiple sclerosis and overactive bladder is Botox. Uh, it has been approved for neurogenic bladder in 2011. We've been using it for over 10 years with wonderful results. 
It blocks the nerve endings in the bladder muscle and decreases the bladder spasticity and sensitivity. You have way more control, way less leakage, and it, overall, a significant improvement in quality of life. It is safe in urogenic bladder and it is safe in MS. It's an office-based procedure, only takes a few minutes to do, and it lasts about six months. Uh, for some patients, we can go nine to 12 months. The side effects include urinary tract infections, blood in the urine, and sometimes it works too well and you can't pee. That's only about five to 10% of the time, but we can certainly help you manage through that. The next option for majority of patients with overactive bladder is a posterior tibial nerve stimulator. As you can see here, it's an electrical therapy. It's put. Uh, it's an electrode that's placed in the, uh, next to the ankle, and it sends an electrical current to the same nerves that go to the bladder, and it helps reset your bladder and give you some more control of the urgency and the frequency primarily. It's been shown to be about 70 to 80% effective in general population, and it's better than a um, medicine, and it's better than placebo in the clinical studies that have been done. For patients with MS, uh, their response rate isn't as good, but it's been shown to be closer to probably around 60, 66%. It's a very non-invasive treatment option. There's no implant, and this is done in the office, but it does require frequent trips to the office to do this treatment. Uh, next up is a sacral nerve neuromodulation. This is a device that's used for overactive bladder. It's, there's two companies that make it, one's Medtronic, one's Exonix. It is an implant. It's a small device that goes in your buttock and the nerve uh, and the wire or electrode goes to the nerve that goes to the bladder. It helps reset the bladder, helps again, helps your brain talk to the bladder to control the urge, the frequency and the spasms. Uh, it's been on the market for quite a long time uh, as well, as similar to Botox. It's FDA approved for overactive bladder, and it results in about 60% improvement for most patients. It can also be helpful with fecal incontinence and fecal urgency, which is a big, big deal for many patients with neurogenic bowel. And it is now MRI compatible. For many years, this device was not MRI compatible, but it is now. So it's now become a very good option for many patients with neurologic disease who need MRIs, specifically our MS population. The limitations of this implant is that the battery life um, is about 10 years, so eventually you'll need it replaced. Uh, there's a rechargeable option as well. And the limitation, the really big limitation of this treatment, even though it's really excellent upfront, it, with MS, as MS progresses, as you may develop another lesion here and there, the communication between the nerves changes and the device may lose efficacy. So MS patients are more likely to fail in the long term because of the changes in the MS disease itself, which is why it's technically off-label use for a neurogenic bladder. Uh, uh, but again, it's so effective for overactive bladder that we often do use it, uh, it even if there is a component of a neurologic problem, as long as the MS is stable. It's certainly not a good option for somebody with an active changing MS disease. Um, there, there is a kind of another component of all of this. So that all these treatments I just discussed are really good to help you control the urge, control the leak. But what about not being able to pee? Unfortunately, some MS patients, especially those with a, uh, spinal cord lesions, may have trouble going, and that can result in abnormal urethral sphincter opening. Now, you may also have an enlarged prostate or a weak bladder. Those things happen to people without neurologic disease. And so part of my job is to figure out which one is it and to be able to offer you some treatments for that. Again, uh, the inner stem device is sacral neuromodulation is an option for patients who have trouble going. Um, it is uh, not as successful in that, in that role, in that indication, but it's still an option. Uh, another option is to learn how to catheterize your bladder or to have a catheter placed, which you know are not as good of an option because it is not a natural urination mechanism. Uh, 
there is what I call advanced disease, you know, so you've tried all these things and either your symptoms are not controlled or your quality of life is still not where you want it to be, or you don't want to have a catheter. What can we do? Well, there is always reconstructive surgery or urinary diversion. Uh, another thing in advanced disease that I am going to be concentrating on is preventing infections, regardless of what how we choose to manage the bladder because infections can lead to worsening MS symptoms and also preventing wound complications for patients who unfortunately may be bed bound um, and, and are leaking a lot. Uh, and those are the things that really lead to long-term complications. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is that uh, in my clinic, I tried to use a, a new tool that we've developed for both neurogenic bladder and an overactive bladder. And it's kind of an electronic um, care companion. It's essentially an education a series or a series of materials that can uh, help you understand the bladder issues that you're having and how they can be managed. It's integrated into Epic. You will get my chart notifications when you're signed up for it. It will ask you to fill out some questionnaires to better guide your symptoms, um, and it'll provide some education for you. Um, there is a little pathway that we just went over, which is kind of like, where do we start? You know, what, what do we need to work on? We work on behavioral things and we work on medicines. Then we talk about advanced treatment options. And this My Chart Care Companion can help you kind of go through each step of the pathway uh, to learn more about your bladder. Okay. That's all I have for today. There's a lot more I can always talk about, but I'm going to go ahead and stop so I don't run out of over time too much. Thank you so much, Dr. Crescens. We, we so appreciate that presentation. Really wonderful. And I actually had the pleasure of spending some time in clinic with Dr. Crescens and observed some of the procedures that she discussed and patients did very well. So uh, don't be afraid and reach out, ask us questions if you have any, and make sure to put your questions into the Q&A chat box. Um, and I want to let you know as well that we do have bladder scanners at both our Martha Morehouse uh, location as well as Gehanna. We discuss bladder issues and other symptoms in the quality of life clinic in our MS multidisciplinary clinic. But as ever, at any patient visit with your provider, if you're having bladder difficulties at all, please let them know and we'll go ahead and get a bladder scan. So thank you again, Dr. Crescens. And we are going to move on for another exciting presentation. It's going to be my pleasure to introduce Cassie Vietas. And uh, our next speaker, Dr. Cassie, is a pelvic floor physical therapist at the Ohio State Pelvic Health Physical Therapy Clinic, and that is located in Gehanna. She treats clients with a range of pelvic floor dysfunction, including bowel, bowel and bladder and sexual dysfunction. She completed her clinical doctorate in physical therapy at Simmons University in Boston in 2021, and she came to Ohio State for a residency in women's health physical therapy, which she completed in 2022. She received her clinical specialty in women's health in June of 2021. She has a special interest in pelvic health for persons with multiple sclerosis and other neurodegenerative conditions. And we're very excited to hear her presentation today. Dr. Vietas. Thank you so much, Christy. I'm just gonna get my presentation up here. Okay, there we go. All righty. Um, like Christy said, my name is Cassie, and I'm here to talk about pelvic floor PT and its role in treating symptoms of pelvic floor dysfunction in persons with multiple sclerosis. I am so excited to be here. All right, so I have no disclosures for this presentation, but I do have a map of where we're going to go today. So pretty much in this presentation, we're going to go over what the pelvic floor is and what systems it affects why it's important to see a pelvic floor PT and how the evidence supports coming to a pelvic floor PT and when to come, how pelvic floor P PT works, including what a first visit looked like and what further treatments look like, as well as where to find a pelvic floor PT, um, whether that be at Ohio State or somewhere near you if you're not near Columbus. Um, all right. Okay, so what is the pelvic floor? So 
The pelvic floor is a collection of muscles that are within the pelvic bowl. So pretty much anything that you sit on like a bike seat, you can consider that the pelvic floor. They span between the pubic bone to the tailbone and in between our sit bones on each pelvis. They help keep us continent by squeezing to hold urine, stool, or gas back, as well as relax to allow those things to exit our bodies. They're also vitally important to sexual health, our balance, and our lymphatic system. These muscles are often not talked about in the general population. It's not like everyone's going around telling the health of their pelvic floors um, between people. But in those with MS, the pelvic floor muscles are greatly impacted, whether that's due to spasticity or changed and muddled communication between the brain and our pelvis. So, and how that interaction changes might be affect your urinary system, your bowels, or sexual function. So that might show up in a lot of different ways. Um, in persons with MS, it might be a big, quick onset of urges to urinate, incontinence with urge to urinate, or with laughing, coughing, sneezing, or even just like when you're sitting around. It might be frequent visits to the bathroom, having shyness and a difficult ability to empty. And for bowel movements, it might present as really big urges to have a bowel movement, leakage with bowel movements, constipation, really frequent bowel movements, or maybe at the end of a bowel movement, you don't feel quite empty. Sexual dysfunction is also very common in those with MS um, and might present as a pain with participation in any sexual activity, pain with arousal or orgasmic changes. Lastly, pelvic pain is very common in patients with MS, whether that be pain in the tailbone, abdomen, pain in the front of the pelvis, low back or hips. If you're experiencing any of these symptoms, it's not something that you necessarily have to resign yourself to live with long term. Um, so we got to reach out to your doctor and get a referral because there are PTs who are here to help you and are excited. All right, so going into a little bit of the why, so the research behind how this is impactful for people. So, you know, we talked about how pelvic floor symptoms might show up, but the research says that between one third and two thirds of persons with multiple sclerosis have some sort of pelvic floor dysfunction that moderately or severely affects their quality of life. Low balling, that means around 41% of patients um, with MS have bladder dysfunction, 30% have bowel dysfunction, and 41% have sexual dysfunction that in impacts their quality of life. More than likely, everyone who's listening tonight has at least one of those categories. And the research demonstrates that pelvic floor PT has been shown um, to be highly effective with those who have urinary leakage, urgency, and reducing the number of bathroom trips. It has been shown to reduce the number of events of fecal smearing and incontinence, um, bloating, and frequency of bowel movements, as well as constipation. It improves sexual satisfaction and decreases pain with intimacy. And overall, the research says that pelvic floor PT has helped with the quality of life around these symptoms. So it might not decrease them completely, but it allows you to um, participate in your day-to-day -day life with a little bit more joy and function. All right, so how does PT work? So every patient is different. So every visit in PT is going to be different and unique to each patient that comes in. The first visit is what I like to call a get to know you visit. So we'll talk expansively about your pelvic floor symptoms, including your bowel, bladder, and sexual health. And as well as we'll talk about food intake, water, your participation in exercise, and as well as your MS history. So that might be like, you know, what most recent flare you've had, or talking about if you've been to PT for balance or strength, what things you worked on so that we don't double dip. Additionally, I might also talk with you about your history of bowel and bladder um, before your diagnosis of MS, depending on when that was. Oftentimes that gives me a better understanding of your personal habits that may or may not actually cause your pelvic floor dysfunction to be a symptom of your MS, but instead, something else altogether. 
we do a lot of testing and that might be looking at your hip strength, your range of motion, your abdominal strength, your back range of motion, how well you move, your breathing and your pelvic floor function. Assessing pelvic floor function is completely unique to each patient within their comfort and their mobility. So sometimes that looks like what's called an internal exam that is um, done per patient, but it also might be a modified exam with fingertips on your tailbone. During this visit, we also plan um, how long that we're going to see each other and how many times. Oftentimes, I see patients anywhere from 8 to 24 weeks, and that's pretty consistent between most um, pelvic floor PTs, but it really depends on your needs, how many symptoms you've got going on, and how often you can get in. Lastly, as always, PTs send you home with a little homework. So that might be exercises, whether that be pelvic floor exercises, like Dr. Crescenz was talking about, um, lifestyle changes, whether that's like, you know, bowel bladder um, changes, like habits, um, and then maybe something like a bladder diary or a bowel log. So just like there's an array of things that we might talk about at the first treatment, there is an absolute array of treatment for folks who come to PT and what we might be doing with them. So um, the treatment might be focused on strengthening your pelvic muscles. It might be focused on relaxing your pelvic muscles if they're really spastic. Um, we often focus on strengthening your hips and core to help support your pelvic muscles just a little bit better. We might focus on breathing techniques to improve your ability to go to the bathroom, um, as well as improve your relaxation of your nervous system and improve the motion of the pelvic floor. We might talk about small um, behavioral changes like changes around diet and water intake, as well as how often you, you visit the bathroom um, and the techniques that you might use around going to the bathroom. So something like maybe urge deferral or helping you void completely. More specifically to the pelvic floor, oftentimes we do biofeedback training. Um, Dr. Crescenz did a really great job like introing that for me. Um, so biofeedback training is the use of small electrodes that look at the pelvic floor function. So essentially, as you squeeze your pelvic floor or stop the flow of urine and gas, that number should go up and increase because your muscles are working harder. As we let go of those um, muscles, we'll see that number go back down. So often I use this as a visual tool for patients. Our pelvic muscles sit right at the bottom of our um, you know, abdominal cavity and we can't see them. So it's hard for our brains to visualize how those muscles are moving, especially when those muscles are weak or very tense. Um, oftentimes I might also use different types of biofeedback, which is really just using something to tell you what's happening in your body. So that might be sitting on a towel roll, um, or like a yoga ball. It might be self-visualization of what's happening at those muscles. Um, so there's a lot of ways to see the improvement with biofeedback that aren't just the machine, if that's not something you're comfortable with. Lastly, oftentimes I am working heavily on balance with persons with multiple sclerosis because with that urgency with bowel movements or urinary um, function, what ends up happening is that our brains can't think about walking or balancing to get to the bathroom and holding our urine. So working on balance and what's called dual task training can often help patients with MS deal with that kind of urge and kind of brain takeover that happens when you get the urge to urinate. While these are common things that we might work on, it's not expansive to everything I do during the day. You know, between all the patients I see, I probably in all the, the things I do, I probably could give like a three hour long conversation about this. It, so everybody's different and everybody gets a different treatment, um, which is why um, I'm talking about where you can find a PT. So here at Ohio State, we have 17 pelvic floor therapists located in six different locations all around Columbus. In order to come see us, all you need is a referral from your doctor, and then you can call in and make an appointment at any of our um, uh, clinics.
but I'm going to guess that many of you who are listening don't live directly near Columbus. So there are two different ways to find um, a pelvic floor PT. There are two different links here. And at the end of this presentation, I know that this gets linked into the um like a, a website and you're able to go in and click from here. But basically you'll click on any of these and you'll type in your zip code and you're able to find pelvic floor PTs near you. And you can even search a little um, more refined than that. You, you can type in like for neurogenic or bladder, or you can type in for urinary function or bladder or bowel function, um, whatever you might be coming in for. Um, and then you're able to see all the PTs that might be treating near you. So I have one more what that we're going to talk about, and that is what can I do right now to start working on my pelvic floor function? So the best thing that you can do to start, and it's the most universal thing that I do, is work on breathing with patients. So the diaphragm and the pelvic floor are what's in called phase lock movement. So basically like a piston, when one moves up, the other one moves up. You can see this nicely on this diagram I have here. When one goes down, the other one goes down. That helps uh, manage the intra-abdominal pressure in our bodies, and we can use it to our advantage to help use our pelvic floor more effectively. So starting today, if you want to work on your pelvic floor health, you're going to take um, 10 to 20 breaths three to four times a day. The goal is, is that you're breathing in through your mouth or nose, whatever is more comfortable for you, letting the air fill your lungs your belly will rise and your rib cage will open. You'll exhale slowly, allowing your belly to go back to resting. And then you'll try this again over and over for 10 to 20 breaths. And this simple exercise will set you up for success when you do um, see a pelvic floor physical therapist in the future. And that is all that I have. Thank you so much for allowing me to spend some time here with you today. And I'm so glad that I got to be here. Thank you so much, Dr. Vietas. What a wonderful presentation. And I'm sure everyone out there like me was just practicing their breathing. So um, again, I want to encourage everyone to go ahead and put your questions that you might have into the Q&A box. And if you feel like you're having any issues with pelvic floor, please discuss this with your provider and we're happy to place that referral. And we are going to move on. And remember, again, please put your questions into the Q&A box. So next, it's we're going to change gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about some exciting research issues. And it's going to be my absolute pleasure to introduce one of our fabulous uh, clinical research coordinators that I work with on a weekly basis in our MS clinic. We have a lot of trials going on in our MS research group. Um, so we're going to be hearing from Dr. Ryan Dickerson. Ryan is a clinical research coordinator within the neurology department's MS clinical research group. He completed his undergraduate and graduate education here at the Ohio State University, and he has an extensive research background both in the lab and in the clinical setting. As part of his role as a research coordinator, he is involved in both OSU faculty-initiated research trials and industry-sponsored trials. And I can tell you that he has saved me many times when I'm having a glitch with a you know, particular uh, tablet <laughs> in clinic. Ryan is always there and he's such a positive president, a presence in clinic. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ryan Dickerson. Dr. Ryan? Well, thank you so much for the warm introduction, Christy. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, again, my name is Ryan Dickerson. I'm one of the clinical research coordinators here. And uh, what I wanna talk to uh, everyone today about is just some basics about what clinical research is, what you can expect if you choose to participate in one of our trials, and just give a brief introduction about some of the projects that we have going on uh, in the clinic. Um, so, you know, starting off right with some definitions. So what's clinical research? It's a medical research that studies how and helps us understand health and disease, but it's always being done in a clinical population. So as opposed to something that's really starting off the bat in the lab or something that may be using an animal model, this is gonna be research conducted in all of you. Um, it really helps uh, physicians and other healthcare providers better understand disease so they can treat and prevent illness more efficiently. Um, additionally, it helps us 
learn things about basic things about how the body works, how illnesses develop, and how they progress over time. Uh, it gives us more information about new treatments. So, you know, how much of a particular new drug do we have to administer to get the outcome that we want? Are there any side effects that we should be concerned about? Does it work? Um, lastly, it gives us some uh, basic understanding of how lifestyle and life circumstances influence disease frequency and uh, healthcare outcomes. Um, generally speaking, uh, clinical research is divided into two general bodies. Uh, observational studies and clinical trials. Um, you can subdivide you know, further once you get within those two categories, but just to keep it simple, I'll just talk about these two. Uh, observational studies typically uh, will not have participants that are assigned into a test group. And that can be a group that's researching a new drug, a new medical device, um, a particular procedure. Um, but importantly, they, a participant may be choosing to participate in a one of these particular things on their own, but it's not us telling them, you know, you're going to be in group A or group B. Um, additionally, uh, observational studies are really useful in understanding associations between variables. That could be something like Tylenol and headaches or anything like that. So a drug and its outcome or a device and its outcome, but it can't really talk much about causation. Um, additionally, observational studies really they generate a lot of new associations that can then be teased out in clinical trials to better understand them that way. Um, observational studies are also really useful when a clinical trial just wouldn't be appropriate. Um, so that could be something that's a really long-term observational study that perhaps people are monitored for years and decades, something that's really outside of the scope of what a clinical trial would be able to do. Um, additionally, it's really useful for um, high risk things. So, you know, it really wouldn't be ethical for us to put people in harm's way, but if someone's choosing to do those things on their own, we can monitor, um, you know, how things progress for them as, as time continues. Um, so switching gears, clinical trials, um, sort of as a, as a um, opposite side of that, we are going to be randomizing people into different arms of treatment. And it's typically done in a blinded fashion where a participant doesn't know, you know, if they're taking, you know, the investigational drug or if they're taking a placebo or you know, whatever drug it's being compared to. Um, oftentimes, the healthcare providers also don't know those things. So that would be considered a double-blinded trial. Um, and th those are really considered the gold standard um, when pharmaceuticals or other researchers are trying to show some um, things that are doing the intended outcome. Um, additionally, um, like I mentioned, that blinding process really can be a little disconcerting for some participants just because they want to get those results, but it's just sort of the nature of how clinical trials are ran. And um, oftentimes it's a, it's a decision that people have to make if they want to perhaps be randomized into a placebo group. So that's something to consider as you're cons thinking about joining a particular clinical trial. Um, Throughout the uh, research process, clinical trials are broadly divided into four phases, depending on how far along in the research process they are. And you know, the smaller the phase, typically the lower the number of participants that will be in the trial. So a phase one trial that's really seeking to answer the question, is the treatment safe, may have you know, 50 people, 100 people, but it's not gonna typically be a huge cohort uh, versus we start getting up to phase two trials, which are really asking the question, does the treatment work? Um, those may be you know, a couple hundred people, phase three, even larger, phase three really trying to establish, is the treatment better? Is it better than other um, treatments that are already available on the market? Or is it better than doing nothing at all? And typically if all goes well with phases one, two, and three, uh, then it will be reviewed by the FDA and if it gets approval and people start taking that, um, you know, as, a, as they're prescribed by the clinicians, then we can sort of move into a phase four trial, which is gonna be the largest number of participants really seeing how that new drug or product is performing in the real world with a whole variety of unique situations that people bring to the table. So who can participate? Um, all clinical trials at Ohio State and generally in the United States are going to be um, there's some oversight by a, a body called the Institutional Review Board, or the IRB, 
that is a group of people that are not associated with the study themselves, but they really have some oversight to make sure that the research is being conducted in an ethical manner and that uh, research participants are you know, being treated properly and not putting an, any un undue risk. And um, the protocol that the IRB reviews is going to be established by either the sponsor or the lead investigator. And um, within that document, that's where they're going to establish the rationale for the study. Um, they're going to set some inclusion and ex exclusion criteria, as well as dictate the number of participants that are needed. And that's all sort of done through a statistical manner. Um, so below, I sort of entered um, sort of a generic inclusion exclusion criteria, just so you can get a sense for it. This is one that I sort of made up, but it's quite typical of what we may see with some of our industry sponsored trials. So the, they're, they're going to set you know, the type of people that they want to test their drug on. So if it's adults or if it's a pediatric, um, pediatric drug that's going to be tested, they'll specify that as well if there's a specific diagnosis that they really want to test their drug in. Um, they may say, uh, set some other things uh, as far as, you know, relapse frequency or, you know, perhaps some, you know, mobility things just because the battery of tests that we're going to be doing will require some of those um, diagnostics. Um, typically, exclusionary things are added in as ways to control for confounding variables as well as um, you know, try to mitigate some safety concerns. So that's something we often see with women who are pregnant or who may become pregnant. Um, if there's sort of a, another drug that's sort of contraindicated with uh, the new investigational product that they're putting forward, oftentimes they'll set that forward. So we can just make sure that people are going to have the best experience possible as they're going through and not have uh, any surprises. Um, so if you decide that you know, a clinical research project is something that you may be interested in participating in. The first thing that a research coordinator or any of the clinicians, research staff that are involved with the trial are going to do is go through an informed consent process with you. And the purpose of that is really to just arm you with all the facts so that you can make the correct choice based off of your needs. Uh, some of the things that we talk about in that formed consent, consent process uh, would be the study duration, how frequently you're going to be coming in to see us. Um, often we're going to give a really comprehensive view of what we're going to be doing during those visits. Um, like I mentioned, sometimes it could be you're going to be taking a walk around the hallway with us. Um, sometimes we're going to be drawing some blood from you. All that's going to be uh, laid out for you in the informed consent process. Um, really, that sort of leads into the next really digging deep into what are the risks and potential benefits for your participation with us. Um, I want this to be as transparent as possible whenever I'm going through a, a conformed set, uh, informed consent process with someone because this is you know, really serious stuff. We want to make sure that you are entering into a project willingly knowing all the facts. Um, oftentimes, we'll talk a lot about data security. So you know, are your, is your identity safe while you're participating? How will the sponsor see your data? Um, that's something that we discuss, as well as, you know, what are some other treatment options that are already available on the market? If you're weighing the, the odds between, do I want to uh, partake in something that's investigational or do I want to stick with the standard of care? Um, additionally, we'll go over costs of participation, if there are any, um, if there's any sort of uh, stipend for your participation, that would be something that we discussed as well as making sure you have all of the contact information for the principal investigator who's leading the trial. Um, importantly, once we go through all that, you would have the opportunity to ask ample questions. If it's something you don't wanna make a, a election about participating or not, then you can always take that document home, review it, talk to your primary care physician, talk to your family. Um, you can always get back to us before you, you actually say yes or no. Um, once you do decide to participate, we'll just collect some signatures, make sure that you have copies all, of all of that for your records. Um, but most importantly, even after you sign, you are absolutely welcome to uh, stop participating at any time. Your uh, participation is voluntary. And if you do decide to withdraw from the study, it won't have any bearing about the quality of care that you receive at Ohio State or your relationship with anyone in your healthcare team. Um, so this is sort of a typical uh, study schedule. This is for one of our ongoing um, drug trials right now. It's broadly divided into three categories. 
Uh, the first being a screening period. Um, so within that study document, study protocol, um, there's going to be a lot of things that we need to make sure that you actually meet all the criteria. So that screening period allows us to just sort of do some of those baseline diagnostics, uh, make sure that, you know, all the boxes are checked and everything's good to go. Um, once we get that sort of secured, we can move into the main treatment period. So starting that, um, typically, if it's going to be a randomized controlled trial, the randomization of it will happen right at the beginning, and then you'll be sort of selected into either a treatment arm or a treatment arm of an investigational product or of the whatever it's being compared to, be it a placebo or be it an existing product that's on the market. Um, this particular trial has visits every 12 weeks, but every protocol is a little bit different. I just want to sort of give a, an introduction of what it may look like. And then some, some trials may also have the opportunity to continue on an open label extension period where everyone could switch to the product, even if they were on the compared arm later. Um, things that we types, ways that we collect data during some of our research visits, we'll do a really comprehensive review of your medical history and current medications. Um, we always start off with taking some vitals just so we can keep track of that, make sure that nothing is changing as we're starting to administer anything. Um, some different questionnaires about uh, quality of life, um, satisfaction on the trial, all things, all sorts of things like that. Um, a lot of lab results. So we could be drawing blood, collecting urine, saliva, sometimes cerebral spinal fluid. Again, all of those are going to be dictated in the actual protocol that is approved by that IRB. Um, sometimes we collect imaging data, uh, functional assessments to establish um, disability, and a comprehensive physical exam. So you may be wondering, you know, how would a research different research visit look different from a typical clinical visit? Um, so again, that really depends on what the protocol dictates. So some you know, more straightforward research protocols, if it's a short data collection that the research is gonna do, we can often piggyback that off your existing clinical visits. Um, so those are nice because you don't have to make a special trip out. Oftentimes they may only take 20 to 30 minutes extra, um, but that's something that, you know, is sort of unique to those type of protocols. Other more involved trials may last several hours. And typically for those, uh, we would prefer to have a unique research visit um, scheduled with you. Uh, and, you know, we can build in if it's a really long day. I know I often like to build in lunch breaks and <laughs> ways that it can be a little more comfortable for uh, participants as they're spending the day with us. Um, also, something that's a little unique when you're participating in uh, research trials, you often get to interact with a lot of people within the team. Um, so instead of just seeing your typical neurologist, you're going to see perhaps several clinicians. You're going to interact with me and some of my other colleagues as research coordinators, some of the folks in the imaging group, um, you really get a, a nice comprehensive introduction to everyone on the team. Um, other things to remember, like I mentioned, uh, both you and your physician may be blinded. You may not have access to some of the uh, laboratory results that we are collecting as part of the research trial, and that's very normal. It's just part of that blinding process so that we don't introduce any sort of treatment bias in, that your clinician may sort of make some assumptions about which group you're in or not. Um, additionally, um, because it is typically going to be long visits, oftentimes we're doing things that are above and beyond what the standard of care would be from a diagnostic standpoint. And that's totally normal. You should expect that. It's just us making sure that we're collecting all the right data, both from a research question as well as sort of a safety standpoint as well. Um, some of the trials, like depending on what the how the protocol is written and what the sponsor is dictated, if they're really long visits or if they're multi-day visits, um, sometimes there is um, reimbursement available for if you have to spend the night, so you can come for two days in a row, or if uh, you're not able to secure your own transportation here, sometimes we can have um, like transportation services that can pick you up and drop you off as well. So those are things that you can ask. Um, the research coordinators about as they're going through an informed consent process with you, and they can give you all those details. Um, so last here, this is just sort of a quick snapshot of the different trials that we have going on within our group. Um, you can see we have several, uh, both clinical trials as well as observational trials that are ongoing. Um, at this time, we're only really enrolling from an MS standpoint, um, sort of for two observational trials. One's uh, biomarkers of biological aging and multiple sclerosis. Um, that one's really aiming to understand how the difference of how, as people age, of course, we, we acquire a lot of things that we didn't have uh, when we were younger. And a lot of the tools that uh, were designed to assess 
sort of disability and MS were designed in a younger pe uh, younger group of people. So we want to see both, you know, from a, a tool standpoint, how things are different, but also from like a biological molecular standpoint. So they may be looking at different DNA markers and things of that nature, really comparing between patients that have M MS and patients that don't have MS to better understand as we age, what does that mean? Um, we also are participating in the Neuroscience Research Institute Brain Bank and Biorepository. Um, so that's just building a library of samples that are available for researchers to um, put in a request for, and they can really ask a lot of questions from the samples that we bank there. Um, a lot of our other studies that are ongoing, some of them are sort of close to new people enrolling at this time, but we do have several that are in the planning phases, probably getting started towards the end of this year into next year. Um, can't really discuss those just quite yet, just because they're still in the works, um, but stay tuned for more information about that. And we would really enjoy having uh, more of you participate with us. And lastly, you know, uh, the last thing that I, I really wanted to sort of take note of when I'm interacting with a lot of our research patients, a lot of them tell me that they get a lot of empowerment out of participating because they feel like they're taking an active role in both their own care as well as what is going to be up and coming for how people with their same diagnosis are treated in the future. So by participating, you can be you know, that extra piece of the puzzle that may help the way people are being treated in the future. And really all of these breakthroughs and everything that changes our paradigms of how we're treating and understanding things cannot be done without people that volunteer and uh, participate in our trials. Um, so with that, uh, just a quick thank you all for your attendance. Um, and of course, both for all of our clinicians and faculty, as well as uh, our clinical research staff that I have listed up here. Thank you. Um, both of these emails, this msresearch at osumc.edu is available if you have any questions or feel free to uh, email or call me. All of my contact information is there below. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ryan. That's wonderful. And I do want to let you know we are also still enrolling for the MS Disease Intervention Program. And that is a trial looking at a 12-week lifestyle intervention. And that is open and we are accepting patients. If you're interested in knowing more about the MS DIP project, you can use that contact information that Dr. Dickerson put up on the screen or ask us about that. So uh, now we're going to make a little um, just to switch over to a different type of research. And we're going to investigate a little bit of what's going on in the basic science research lab. As many of you know, Dr. Benjamin Segal, the chairman of our department has a big research lab over on main campus. And we are going to hear from a researcher in Dr. Segal's lab. So it's gonna be my pleasure to introduce Callie Bellinger. She's a third year graduate student in the neuroscience graduate program at OSU. And she is part of the Dr. Benjamin Segal lab. She obtained her bachelor of arts in neuroscience at the University of Virginia in 2019. Her research primarily involves studying the role of myeloid cells, immune cells that function as first responders in a mouse model of multiple sclerosis. So we look forward to hearing what Callie is going to tell us about some of the exciting basic science research in Dr. Skull's lab. Callie? Thank you for that great introduction. I'm going to set up my slides. There we go. Like I said, this is gonna be quite a different talk than what you've heard before. This is gonna be heavy on the science, but I hopefully I can present it to you in a way that is palatable and not too boring. Uh, I'm a third year graduate student in Dr. Benjamin Segal's lab. It's been an absolute pleasure being in his lab and I've learned a lot about MS and it's been great to hear about all the different clinical aspects of MS that I'm usually more removed from as a research scientist. So today I'm gonna to be talking about immature neutrophils as a potential therapy uh, in MS. So first, let's go slide, there we go. Let me get my cursor real quick. Uh, so first I'd like to start in the basic um, background information on the brain and some of the damage that occurs during MS. One of the main disruptions in multiple sclerosis is damage to brain cell cells known as neurons. Neurons send and receive information uh, through electrical signals throughout the body. You can think of neurons more like an electrical wire. You have the wire, which is known as the axon for a neuron, or um, that sends and transmits information. 
as well as the rubber coating, which is the myelin of the neuron. This helps protect the axon, as well as helps uh, transmit information in a more uh, conductive manner. When damage occurs to the myelin or the rubber coating, uh, the electricity, the conduction is lost, but also the axon itself can be exposed to other pathogens that can then lead to degradation of the neuron. Now, in all of us, we have white blood cells, also known as immune cells, that circulate throughout our bloodstream. Normally, immune cells will stay out of the brain because we have this uh, three-layer um, barrier known as the blood-brain barrier. But in multiple sclerosis, what happens is there's a leak in that barrier and immune cells then can enter into the brain and cause destruction of those axons and myelin I was just talking about. Once those destructive immune cells enter the central nervous system, they can interact uh, and then multiply and release damaging factors that cause that destruction and damage to the axon and myelin, which might eventually lead to neuronal death. Naturally, we would like to use drugs and therapies that prevent these immune cells from coming in to the CNS um, or the central nervous system, prevent them from releasing those damaging factors, prevent them from interacting with uh, other immune cells. And in fact, we do have drugs that do just that. Ocrevus is one of them uh, that targets an immune cell known as a B cell. We also have netlizumab, which helps prevent immune cells from getting into the central nervous system. Now, the problem is that most people with multiple sclerosis already have some form of a nervous system damage by the time of the diagnosis. As the next advancement in MS therapy, at least to me, we need to have treatments that actually help reverse that neurological damage and further prevent more damage from occurring. This will lead to my project as I aim on focusing on treating neuronal damage that has already occurred. Now, I'm gonna go through a lot of mouse studies and I thought it would be great to give some background on a mouse model of multiple sclerosis, which maybe not all of you know. Uh, it's called experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. That is a mouthful, so I'm gonna to refer to it as EAE from now on. Now, by no means, this is a perfect model for multiple sclerosis. However, it does allow us to study how immune responses, um, similar immune responses that we see in uh, MS. Now, EAE relies on injecting immune cells, or those white blood cells I was talking about, that will specifically attack myelin within the mouse. We will then track the disease course of the mouse, and we do this through a uh, numerical scoring system. Zero being no disease, so normally how the disease progression goes along, once we, progress, uh, once we inject those white uh, blood cells that will attack that myelin, there's no disease, and eventually the mouse will onset. Now, onset is more of a ascending paralysis. You'll see a limp tail, they'll have difficulty writing themselves, and as the disease progresses, they show a more increased uh, hind limb weakness and then paralysis. So th this indicates that a higher um, clinical score means a more progressive form, uh, more progression of uh, MS or EAE in this mouse model. Let's go forward, there we go. Now, I mentioned in the very beginning this thing called neutrophils, and I haven't talked about it since. Uh, neutrophils are one of the most abundant white blood cells in the human body. About 60% of white blood cells are neutrophils. They are quite short-lived. Uh, this is a little bit debatable in the literature. Some people say it's six hours, 24 hours. It really depends on the individual as well as the circumstance, um, if there's inflammation or not. They're considered the first responders of the immune system. So they are constantly circulating around the uh, bloodstream, surveying path for pathogens, uh, looking into tissues. However, once an infection happens, these uh, neutrophils will mature and activate, as you see here. They will then go to the site of infection and either engulf the pathogen or start releasing pro-inflammatory factors. So factors that will recruit other immune cells to come in, cause a lot of inflammation and take care of that infection. Now you might be thinking, why would the cell be good for MS? You don't want to inc increase the inflammation, that would be bad. Uh, however, what was really cool that in um, Dr. Segal's lab, they found that there is an immature uh, version of these neutrophils that can be polarized to act a bit different. So we found that when you, um, uh, in, sorry, let me backtrack a little bit. So these immature neutrophils can be quite protective and reparative in the central nervous system. We use this in a different mouse model, a uh, neuronal injury model known as the optic nerve crush model. 
Um, and we found that when we introduced these uh, neutrophils, we found more nerve repair uh, following the injury site. So this, let's see if you can actually see my cursor. There we go. I think you can see it now. Um, so normally the optic nerve has a lot of axons running through it. So the optic nerve goes from your brain to your eyes. And when there is no crush, what you'll see is this green, neon green staining. Normally that's going all the way across down the uh, optic nerve. But when you do an optic nerve crush, uh, as indicated by the star, you can see by my cursor, basically we just get forceps and pinch that area. I hope you can appreciate that there is a lack of that neon green staining indicating death and destruction of those axons transversing the optic nerve. However, we found that when we introduce this compound um, called zymosin that helps recruit these immature neutrophils I've been talking about, you'll see a regeneration of those axons by indicating that neon green shifting across the optic nerve. This was really awesome to see in the optic nerve crush model, but you're probably wondering what does this, why do we care? This, we were all interested in MS. So we decided to try to take those immature neutrophils and use them in our EAE, our mouse model of multiple sclerosis. Now, while this project is still in its earlier stages, what we found so far are that these neutrophils reduce neuronal damage uh, that we've seen within the eyes of EAE mice. So kind of similar to what you see in multiple sclerosis of optic neuritis, so the degradation of these brain cells or neurons within the eye, we kind of see that same thing in the mouse. And we found that when we introduced these immature neutrophils peripherally, so not even at the eye, we saw a reduction in uh, damage to those neurons, which is really exciting. Another exciting factor is we found them to be immunosuppressive meaning they helped uh, prevent the proliferation or the multiplication of these immune cells, uh, hopefully dampening that immune response. Now back to this beautiful graph again, what we did was we uh, introduced these immature neutrophils during the disease course of EAE. We really wanted to see if this actually gonna impact the clinical score. Are these mice going to not get sick? Will they uh, have a delay in onset? Will they, uh, the severity of their sickness decrease? And what we found was that when we transferred these neutrophils, so this is, we have a control mouse um, with the green square or the uh, blue squares, the typical EAE course. But when we introduced those immature neutrophils indicated by the green triangles, we found that there is actually a delay in onset of the EAE disease course, as well as a decrease in severity. This indicated to us that maybe these neutrophils are acting as a way to uh, inhibit or prevent that proliferation of immune cells and therefore decreasing inflammation within these mice. Along with the optic nerve data I talked about uh, with the pro-regenerative, these, these neutrophils look like they're a heavy hitter on two sides. They help prevent um, inflammation from occurring as well as repairing any damage that has occurred uh, by being neuroprotective. So in summary of what we've seen in the mice is that we've seen these immature neutrophils that have been polarized that can release reparative factors, as well as prevent the multiplication of immune cells, destructive immune cells, which will, over time could lead to neuronal repair and protection. Again, you might be wondering, oh, this is really cool, but this is all in mice. Why do I care? Uh, how can we translate this to humans? Well, in our lab and actually be the biobank repository that's been talked about already due to patient samples that have been donated, we've been able, we've been able to find these immature neutrophils naturally occurring within the bone marrow of uh, patients. And the goal is, this is a hopefully a potential future ally um, in multiple sclerosis, is that we can take those immature, uh, those uh, removed bone marrow cells, isolate out those immature neutrophils, put them into culture, put polarizing factors in which we've already done in the Seagal lab to create that immature, uh, pro-regenerative, neuroprotective, immunosuppressive, uh, type of cell. And then hopefully in the future, we'd be able to then infuse that back to, uh, back to the patient to help repair any damage that has occurred due to MS. This is the goal. We've already started making some steps to looking at actual human cells, and we have great potential for this. I'm actually really excited. You should look out for Dr. Andrew Jerome's work on this in the future. I would like to thank my lab, Dr. Benjamin Segal, who might be talking. I don't know. He's been a great mentor. Uh, 
really has introduced me a lot into multiple sclerosis. Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Atkinson, as well as Dr. Andrew Jerome, both of which are postdocs that really have helped guide questions that I have during lab and all the technical skills. Dr. Andrew Sass, who has helped guide me with the neutrophils, as well as Dr. Cole Harrington, who is always a great help in reminding me about all of the MS research that's going on in the oligodendrocytes. Another really cool research that you should look into. And with that, that'll be all for me. I hope uh, I'm excited to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Callie. What a wonderful presentation. Such exciting things happening in the Basic Science Research Lab. One of my favorite days of the year is always Neuroscience Day when we get to hear the wonderful presentations by these amazing basic science researchers in their lab. So next, I'm going to let Dr. Giang take over uh, for our Q&A panel. Dr. Giang? Thank you so much, Christy, and what an amazing day. We've just had such wonderful discussions. Um, I have learned a lot, just so much about research, about urinary issues in MS, uh, about how pelvic floor therapy can be helpful, you know, if you have MS. So, you know, thank you to all our speakers. I will open the floor to all the speakers and I see uh, Dr. Segal is still here. So if you could just pull up your cameras on and we will start the Q&A session um, right away. Great. So we learned a lot today um, and uh, I'm just pulling up my Q&A Q banner. Okay, there we go. Uh, I will probably start with maybe some of the research questions. Um, oh, we have Dr. Cartwright with us as well. Dr. Cartwright is one of our MS fellows. I'm sure some of you will see her in clinic very soon. Um, so we'll start with some of the research questions. Um, and I'll go to Dr. Dickerson. Uh, one of the questions says, do you have to be an OSU neurology patient to be involved in, re in a research project? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so typically, yes, we do like to at least have some sort of established relationship of care um, to get started with one of our trials. Um, we often use, um, you know, from a medical record standpoint, we do a lot of documentation there. And um, that's helpful for us on a research side. But also, we do have a lot of our clinicians that are doing a lot of the evaluations here. So I know just in discussing, um, you know, with many of the other panelists, it's a lot it's quite helpful to be able to already have some sort of established relationship there and um, just securing diagnosis and um, all the other things that are involved with that. So uh, yes, typically we would like you to be uh, involved as a patient in our clinic at Ohio State. That is a great answer. You know, I am a principal investigator in a lot of the trials and you know, before we put you into a research, we at least want to see you to confirm that you really have MS and what type of MS you have and just get some details. So that is absolutely right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dickerson for that answer. Um, I see a lot of questions about the basic science research that we talked about. And I see Callie here and I see Dr. Segal. So I'm gonna turn over some of the questions over to them. Uh, we'll start with this one. Do any animals naturally develop MS? MS-like disease or conditions, or is EAE the only way for testing MS treatments in animals? So I will have either yeah. Kalia or Dr. Uh, I can jump on that one, and then uh, Dr. Segal could probably jump on that too. So there are actually multiple, EAE is a broad uh, term for different mouse models in MS. There's quite a few different ways to induce EAE. Uh, but to answer the original question on does it naturally occur in mice, normally no. There are some genetic backgrounds that can induce EAE naturally, uh, or sorry, MS-like disease naturally. But in order to study, uh, have const uh, more constant and more um, controlled experiments, it's easier to induce the disease and keep it all controlled than um, mice spontaneously uh, developing it. Dr. Skull, would you like to add? Um, yes. So um, in general, throughout most laboratories, 
we, you know, deliberately induce this MS-like disease in, in, um, in animals, um, most commonly in mice and, and rats, but it's also been done in guinea pigs and in non-human primates. For example, marmosets, um, which is a, um, a, a species of, of monkey as well as um, macaques. There has been described in a particular um, subset of macaques, uh, the occurrence of an MS-like disease that seems to be related to infection with a particular virus. And that arose naturally. And that is being studied at some laboratories in Oregon. There's also occasionally an MS-like disorder that occurs in, in dogs, which is rare and sporadic. Um, so there are some rare instances in, in as I said, non-human primates and dogs of, of MS-like disease that have, um, you know, uh, some similarities to the human disease. But this is very difficult to predict. Um, and it's relatively rare, so it's difficult to study in the laboratory setting. Thank you very much for those answers. Uh, and then I will do another quick question in terms of the basic science, because there seems to be a lot of questions. And I'm going to lump these questions into one. So several quest uh, questions about clinical trials. Will there be clinical trials with the neutrophil research would the neutrophils need to be introduced early in the disease? And what is the timeline for the potential optic nerve repair that you talked about in some of your slides? So this is more, I mean, this these are two separate questions, I guess. We're yeah. talking about when it's going to be in clinical trials in actual people, and then maybe a little bit about the timeline on how quickly or with the timeline on how the optic nerves get repaired um, in your research. Okay, I was also answering one about polarized neutrophils that I realized I did not describe well. I'll start with that real quick. Uh, it's a blanketed sta uh, statement of saying a polarized neutrophil. Basically, you have mature neutrophils, super inflammatory. Uh, an immature neutrophil is a little bit more changeable, more malleable. You can push it down a pathway that is not as pro-inflammatory. So when I mean polarized neutrophils, it's providing... Uh, factors that can push it down a more anti-inflammatory, more of a reparative uh, function instead of more inflammatory secreting factors that can uh, recruit other cells. For the clinical trial aspect, I think Dr. Segal could talk more on that. I could say my opinion. I think it's quite far off, but it is still the always our goal in research is to get uh, anything that we're researching into clinical trials to have therapies to help patients. In terms of the optic nerve crush uh, or the in the EAE mice, typically what we see in that disease co course, if you remember, we'll start seeing optic neuritis like symptoms uh, around peak uh, of that disease. And if, even when we introduce those neutrophils early on before they even get sick, we notice that there is a decrease in the damage. Now it's hard for us to study whether that is because there, those neutrophils are suppressing the um, inflammation, which is reducing the actual initial damage in the eye, or if it's actually helping repair any damage that has already occurred. So would it need to be introduced at the beginning of MS? I would hope so. I would hope to say no. Uh, it's really hard to treat someone with MS before they develop or before they clinically get diagnosed with MS. Uh, the great thing about the neutrophils that I potentially see is that they can have some reparative function to damage that has already occurred. I hope that answered your questions. I know Dr. Saltgall could probably talk more on the clinical aspects. Okay, thank you, Callie. So as Callie mentioned, we're still in fairly early stages in that we're, we're uh, testing these um, immature neutrophils in the animal model more extensively. But we have identified um, similar cells, as, as Callie alluded to, in bone marrow of, of um, human beings. And we have now developed protocols by which we could stimulate the, the, uh, the bone marrow cells to become even more potent um, uh, 
repair cells. So what we're now doing is developing different uh, methodologies to expand those cells in a dish and to polarize them after we have a large number of them to see if, if we can still uh, trigger them to acquire these properties that, that lead to healing in the nervous system. Um, it's, it's difficult to predict how long that's going to take, but we, we definitely are going to put a lot of effort. This, we, the, the human counterpart was recently discovered in, in the past six months. And right now we're putting a lot of effort into expanding the cells and seeing if we could polarize them in larger numbers. So far, we've looked at um, bone marrow cells from, I believe, eight um individuals, uh, human individuals, and all of them, we were able to polarize or trigger them to acquire these repair properties. And we could actually, after we trigger them, we could put them in a dish with actually human nerve cells and see that they stimulate the human nerve cells to grow new nerve fibers or, or axons. Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll be successful and be able to expand them. So we have large numbers that could be used therapeutically and then ultimately, you know, uh, 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 go to clinical trials. Um, but, uh, you know, um, um, th th this does take time. Um, it's th the time span between an initial discovery and clinical trials in the past would take, you know, five to 10 years, but that's becoming sh um, uh, more and more accelerated, uh, you know, as we get better with clinical trials and designing them. And so we do have actually a, a patent for this therapeutic approach, and we're going to really put a lot of effort into it. So I can't tell you exactly when. Uh, our goal is is to, um, you know, develop this and, and start some uh, clinical trials and um, just got to get Callie and her colleagues to spend more time in the lab. And, you know, I got to crack the whip, but um, we're working on it. That is wonderful to hear. Uh, we're going to move to a slightly different direction. But before we do, uh, we have a comment that says, thank you for the information. Keep doing this good research to help fix the nerve damage. So that, that's just a wonderful comment. Now I'm gonna to move to Dr. Veritas. Uh, there's a few questions for you, two that I'm gonna group, all having to do with um, pelvic floor therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of them asked about double voiding. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And then the second one about breathing exercises. Would breathing exercises be enough or would PT be needed? Um, so I'll start with the double voiding question. Um, absolutely. PT is effective for those who double void. So oftentimes what we'll be working on is like re relaxing to urinate as well as um, kind of giving your body the cues to urinate. Oftentimes with um, MS, those signals from the center that controls urination in your brain that go down to your bladder are a little bit mixed up. So we kind of help create a super highway of information by creating a routine for you. Um, and that's really individual for each patient. And then for breathing, um, for some people, it can be helpful, but it's probably not going to get you exactly where you want to be. Um, so I would start with the breathing and then move on to uh, working with the pelvic floor PT if you can find one near you. That is wonderful. Thank you for that answer. Uh, I have one quick question uh, for Dr. Dickerson. Um, is there any research going on for rare NMOSD since it used to be under the umbrella for MS, but now separate? So you listed a few different MS trials, uh, there were some for MS, there were some for, I think, uh, NMDA encephalitis. Uh, somebody's asking about NMOSD. Uh, I'm not aware that we have a trial on that yet, but just tell them how maybe we get information about new trials coming up. And, you know, sometimes we engage with, you know, different sponsors and researchers to get new trials on board. Yeah, no, thank you. 
Um, so yeah, as Dr. Gang alluded, um, that's not something we have ongoing right now, um, but we are you know, always entertaining um, new trials. Uh, so typically when, um, if we get approached either by a sponsor or you know, an investigator to participate, it's something that you know, as, as a department sort of gets discussed and uh, really trying to establish, do we have do we have both the expertise and you know enough demand to, to fulfill the requirements of some of those studies? Um, and we, we're really careful about it because um, a study startup process, you know, it takes quite a bit of time and effort. Um, so I, to, to answer your question, I'm not aware of any right now that we are overseeing. Um, but for sure, you know, if there was something that uh, came up, came our way, um, that would be something we'd be very interested in uh, learning more about for sure. Thank you for that, wonderful. Uh, there's a few questions that asked about symptoms in MS. Maybe I'll have Christy address some of those. Uh, one asked in general about, you know, what are some of the symptoms a patient with MS may have? Another one asked, is numbness in the abdomen, legs and feet normal with MS? So just maybe a little bit about the different variety of symptoms MS patients could have. Absolutely. As most of you probably know, if you have a disease that impacts your central nervous system, that's really the master computer for your entire body. So you can have a myriad of symptoms that kind of affect every body symptom or system. And one of the things that we do at The Ohio State University, not only in our quality of life clinic, but also in our MS multidisciplinary symptom management clinic, is we review from head to toe all of those symptoms that you may be experiencing. I love that Callie used the analogy of a lamp cord because I, I use that all the time in clinic. Um, you know, So if something is going on with your spinal cord, which is really delivering all those messages, from your brain down to all these important parts of your body, it's, it's involving sensory changes, your bladder, your bowel, your balance, all kinds of different things. When that covering around the nerves is deranged, your light's gonna be blinking, right? The message isn't perfect like it's supposed to be. So you're gonna get those downstream symptoms. So what we really do is we look at a full review of those symptoms. We do things like Dr. Crescent's mentioned, we'll maybe get a bladder scan if you're having some urinary symptoms. Often our patients will get urgency of the bladder. Our patients will have numbness, tingling, weakness. Um, you can have symptoms in the abdomen. You can have a symptom called their meat, where you might have a sharp or uh, electric type shock feeling if you flex your head. So yes, there are many, many symptoms. All of the things that you mentioned are possible if you're a patient living with MS. And it's always important to bring those up at your visit with your doctor so that we can go over them step-by-step, step, head to toe, to see what exact symptoms you may be experiencing and what treatment or therapy we might be able to recommend for you. Excellent. You know, Christy runs multiple multidisciplinary clinics that, you know, really help to address symptoms in MS and quality of life in MS. So definitely, you know, talk to your doctors to be a part of those clinics. Uh, there's a few questions about how to get to see the pelvic floor therapist. Do you need a referral by your neurologist? How, how if, if you want to be seen by uh, Dr. Veritas service, how, how do you get, how do you get in to see, uh, how do we get to get patients into the pelvic floor therapy? So you can get a referral from any of your doctors. Um, and all that it would need to kind of state is what you've got going on, you know, even if that's just pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, and that's that's all you need. Then you schedule a visit. Generally, there's a way because there's not enough pelvic floor PTs that exist yet um, to make it so that we get in like really soon. Um, but like for our clinic, it's about a three month wait to get in to see us. But then once you get in, we get a little bit, um, we get rolling. That is wonderful. So that is something that you could discuss with your doctor for referral. That's great. Uh, this is just a comment. Somebody says, you know, they've been with OSU for nine years and they just want to say that your continued research and Personalized care saved my life. Thank you for what you do. 
we appreciate that comment. Uh, there's a lot of other questions that I don't think we're going to have the time to address. Uh, I see one asking about Mavenclad. Uh, and I'm trying to find it. Uh, does Mavenclad help with MS-related bladder issues? So Mavenclad is one of the disease-modifying treatments. In general, the disease-modifying treatments help to control the progression of the disease and may not necessarily help with the specific symptoms that you're dealing with. Uh, there was a question as well about Ocrevus or maybe a comment about Ocrevus reducing the immunoglobulin levels. Thank you for that comment. That is some, something that we occasionally would see with Ocrevus. Uh, we have two more minutes. So uh, I don't know that we could get to all the questions that are on. I see that some of them have been answered. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Crisens could not stay till the end, but I see that she has answered you know, most of the questions that were directed to her. Uh, any final thoughts from any of our researchers or our clinicians that are on board? I thought th this was just a wonderful avenue to talk about both research and clinical care uh, and is a good way to put things all together. Uh, Christy, any final words or Dr. Segal? <laughs> I would just like to congratulate all the speakers and Christy for uh, being a wonderful host again, and also you, Dr. Yang, you know, for once again, coordinating a great question and answer session. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who attended for your great questions and for your interest. Thank you. Well, I think it's about 7.30 and I don't want to keep us uh, too long. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and we will end the session now. All the videos and all the slides would be available on our website. So just be aware that you can access any of this information on our website. I'll hand this back to Christy and thanks everyone. Thank you everyone again. So exciting to hear from all the speakers and about the amazing basic science research. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. That is all the time we have, unfortunately, and we will address your questions and get those back to you. We'd also like to invite you to log on to wexnermedical.osu.edu slash MS community to learn about updates in our MS program, including details about this and future sessions in this virtual education series. Also, the doctors will be answering questions that we didn't have time to get to in our Q&A session tonight and we'll post the answers on that webpage in the coming days, along with the presentations and a video from tonight's event. There are a lot of wonderful videos there. If you wanna have an MS day and watch a lot of videos, we welcome you to do that. Thank you once again to all my wonderful colleagues for sharing their time and expertise with us, with us this evening. Thank you so much for attending. We would love to learn about you and how we can care for you and your MS or provide you support as a caregiver to someone with MS. You can schedule an appointment with one of our physicians on our website or by calling 614-293-4969. And again, we look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you and good night. Great job, everyone.